Let me welcome uh, Mohammed Kazid Bash. Thank you. A self-described global nomad. We've <laughs> <laughs> uh, been on the road for various NGOs. Uh, he tells me in uh, Asia and uh, many countries, at least 10 countries, I think, and uh, to some extent in, in, in Africa and, uh, and now in Yemen with Mercy Corps. Um, clearly, there's lots going on in Yemen, so we, we hope to hear and to learn a lot from you, uh, Mohammed. Uh, we, we just uh, started to talk about all the various interesting things happening from, from the Houthi rebellion to, to obviously the, uh, the, the, the revolution and uh, the youth revolution, the particular way in which it was resolved in Yemen compared to other countries and what that may uh, mean for the future, the separist, separationist movements That's in the right. South, uh, the, 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 the Qaeda Absolutely issues, yes. there, uh, there. And, and the like. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening. So uh, you've been living there. That's right. And also willingly <laughs> engaged. <laughs> By choice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we hope to hear a lot from you. The um, floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, Thank you all for, for coming and giving me the opportunity and giving Mercy Corps the opportunity to, to um, address such a distinguished crowd here. Um, before I start, there's a, there's a short video that I'd like to, <coughs> to share. It's, it, it's three minutes and it's a video produced by a number of international organizations and, and the UN to highlight the uh, current humanitarian crisis that uh, is uh, is plaguing Yemen uh, and has um, has got the international media attention and the world um, um, political attention also focused around. So, if you would bear with me and perhaps just it's it's a very short video. It's why very colourful. It is in Arabic because we we also like to share it with the Arab diaspora here in North America as well as of course in the Gulf countries. But there are English uh, subtitles to that for those of you who uh, would like to read the English. So if you don't mind, we can, I can just step aside to allow you to have a look at that. Thank you. Oh, you're supposed to be going up. <laughs> وسيكون الاستقبال اليا بالتعالج الطبيعي وفجل باتخاذ اجراءات بالمقر هنا ثمن باهظ يرفعه المجتمع الاسلامي ويؤثر على مستقبل اليمنيين رجالا ونساء واطفالا سيؤثر انعدام الاستجابة الإنسانية في اليمن سلبا على عملية التحول السياسي وأفاق السلام والاستقرار والتنمية على المدى الطويل. جنبا إلى جنب مع الحكومة اليمنية 
من الوصول وهو بشكل مستمر إلى السكان المحتاجين خلال فترة الأزمة والمشاكل الأمنية وتبدي هذه الوكالات القدرة والالتزام على الاستجابة السريعة في حال توفر الدعم المطلوب Well, thank you all for um, for for coming to this uh, this discussion. And the way I I'm planning to to structure it is that I'll I'll speak for a little while and then open up the floor to have opportunities for discussion and and, and dialogue. And, and I'm sure some of you have have questions or clarifications. So if if you're all comfortable with that, I I can start. Um, Yemen, as uh, as many of you know, I mean, is is um, situated, you know, geopolitically in a very, very strategic position on the um, at the bottom tip of the Arabian Peninsula, both uh, hugging the Red Sea as well as the Arabian Sea. So, historically, it has been an area that has been of interest for a number of, of of centuries for well for many uh, countries, empires, and and trading routes, uh, which is reflected in, in the culture and um, uh, ethnicity that presents itself in Yemen, where you have people of um, descendants from Ethiopians, Somalis, and, and, and East Africans, to South Asians, Southeast Asians, um, uh, and, and, and of course from, from the Gulf Peninsula uh, itself. Um, Yemen has only recently been uh, has become a united country back in 1994 after a um, a short civil war but if you talk to the southerners they they still think that it's it wasn't a short civil war it was a very long civil war and it, and it's continuing to be a civil war but in 1994 the two countries um, uh, came together the south was um, uh, Initially, a British protectorate in the in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then um, the Russians moved in on on this side of the Arabian Sea, and you had the the Americans and the French on the other side of the Arabian of the Red Sea. And uh, but in in once the Russians left, the uh, the the southern um, socialist groups and slash communist groups continued to rule the country until 1994, when the North basically invaded and took over the country. Um, since then, uh, it has been ruled, it was ruled by uh, an individual by the name of um, uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh, and he basically ruled the country for 33 odd years. Um, unlike the other Gulf countries that surround Yemen, I mean, it wasn't a monarchy. I mean, he was, he was a uh, lieutenant colonel in the, uh, in the northern Yemeni army, and then once uh, the war took place, he got himself promoted and then became a self-declared field marshal when, and slash president. Um, Ali Abdullah Saleh's rule was... Uh, a very interesting rule in, in the sense that you know he, he does come from the north, but uh, he did uh, his the current president now uh, uh, President Hadi, uh, who had who's been his deputy who was his deputy for over twenty years actually hailed from the south, and and as a result of the uh, uh, unification, Hadi basically turned sides and joined Abdullah Saleh and uh, resulting in the fact that Hadi's own village has basically disowned him. So the poor chap can't go to his own village uh, these days. Um, but uh, the, 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 last, the last couple of years, of course, has seen a dramatic change in, in Yemen, um, with, uh, of course, in, in 2011, when you saw the whole... Uh, Yemen joining the the Arab awakening, as 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 people call it, and spontaneous 
in many ways a spontaneous response of, of young people uh, getting on to, out on the streets of, of urban centers in Yemen, uh, particularly Dai, Sana'a, and, and Adan, and uh, demanding a change, a change that they that many of them felt that uh, uh, was their right and is their right, and a change that many of them believed was not possible. However, with the popular uh, uprising of of really, I mean, uh, independent youth groups. I mean, there were not there weren't any sort of political parties uh, aligned to any of these of these youth movements in the initial stages. Later on, they did come on board. But um, the, the youth movements and the, the, the camps that they set up in these chain squares throughout the country resulted in, um, in, in actually quite a bloody uh, uprising and perhaps the most bloody one uh, other than Syria's, of course, in, in, um, in, the, in the Arab world, where, a num- where just on one particular day, uh, over 22 young youth activists were basically shot dead in, um, in the streets of, of Sana'a. Uh, this only resulted in the uh, more demonstrations taking place, but what really triggered the whole uh, change in events or the, the tipping point was actually the splitting of the Yemeni army. Uh, it basically split down the middle between the Republican Guard, who, was, who is still run and, and, and managed uh, by uh, the former president's son, um, Ahmed uh, uh, Ali Saleh, and then the 1st Armored Division, which uh, is currently being commanded by uh, General Ali Mohsen. And the, that split, and when Ali Mohsen decided to move his brigade and, 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 uh, and division and join the young uh, youth movement and these, uh, uh, this, this sea of change and the demand from the, from the masses for the change of, of uh, uh, the president, that is when the, the tension started to increase and escalate and where we saw shelling and, and open warfare taking place in Sana'a and in Thais cities in particular. But that's really what what triggered, and and you know Ali Ali Mohsen, you know uh, there was there was already bad blood between him and uh, Ahmed uh, and Ali Abdullah Saleh, so it was a uh, an opportune time for him to 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 take this position and and result in uh, splitting of the army that caused the the whole uh, breakdown of of the former regime's uh, rule. With the uh, with this happening at the doorstep of, of of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, obviously the Saudis have historically had very close links with with the Yemenis, and it was in fact the Yemenis who were initially involved in the establishment and building of the modern Kingdom of Saudi Arabia after the oil was discovered by the Brits in in in, in the fifties. It was Yemeni engineers, architects, doctors, scientists. Uh, that went into Saudi Arabia to, to, to build the country in, in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, unlike other Gulf countries, which had then a large influx from, from South Asia and Southeast Asia to come in and, and, and build those countries, such as, such as Oman, Qatar, the Emirates, and uh, Kuwait and Bahrain. Mm-hmm. But, but Saudi Arabia was very much uh, linked, and there are many uh, linked to Yemen, and there are many Saudis of, of Yemeni uh, origin still living and uh, and successfully running businesses and and uh, an industry there. That and it's it's really interesting. In in, in the summer months, you see uh, hordes and hordes of of um, and, uh, vehicles in in all all across um, Yemen in, in in the capital city. As well as in other cities, you know, with Saudi number plates, and it's it's Yemenis coming for the summer holidays back to uh, uh, back to Yemen, and and um, uh, it, it it's really an interesting to see the influx during the summer months of of many of these vehicles with Kuwait number plates, Bahraini number plates, and Saudi number plates in uh, in in towns and cities across across Yemen, um, but. Uh, 
the political crisis, of course, you know, got to such a point that the Gulf Cooperation Council countries uh, decided to take take action, and and they did. And in February, as as you all know, the agreement was signed between um, um, the the GCC countries and um, uh, Ahmed uh, and, and the former president. The former president had had on two other occasions, you know, literally stepped back from signing the agreement and. So there was a little bit of betting going on in, 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 in Sanaa that is he going to sign, isn't he going to sign, so, um, and I did lose $20. But anyway, um, that's, that's all right. Um, but eventually the, it, it, was, it was signed and, um, you know, the new, the new president who, um, who I, I, I basically call the reluctant president because he had on three, if not four occasions, publicly said he doesn't want the job. But, uh, and, and I, I will not, I mean, I mean he, he's got probably the toughest job I can ever think of, and all the tea in China couldn't convince me to, to do that job if offered. Uh, but he, 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 he took over, he took over a country that was um, heavily, uh, Polarized. There was significant breakdown and continues to be a significant breakdown in rule of law. The military was split. Uh, political parties were split. Uh, and yet, you know, the, uh, he had to still run the government. He, uh, the former regime had, uh, the former president had basically placed strategically his sons, nephews, uncles, brother-in-law, son-in-law, cousins in, in all strategic positions throughout, throughout the country, whether it's ministries, whether it was with uh, uh, you know, uh, people within, working in, in industry, and, and what, whichever, whichever business or, or, or daily, daily and any, any aspect of daily life, there was a connection to Ahmed Abdul Masaleh. So just by changing the president, and the rest, you know, still continued to to rule and 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 continue to uh, uh, cause great deal of disruption and undermine at many account uh, many occasions. Uh, they under did they continue to undermine and still continue to undermine the, the the president and what and the changes he's been trying to make. I mean, one one uh, simple event I can um, I can share with you is when he changed the uh, commander of the um, air force, who was uh, Ahmed Abdullah Saleh's brother. Um, the airport was then in Sanaa closed for three days, you know, because the brothers' uh, friends or tribal affiliates decided to invade the airport, and 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 the airport was closed for three days until some deal was negotiated, and then the airport was reopened. So. It's 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 things like that, you know. I mean, he, he he took a presidential order, and then the reaction was very much evident that people were unhappy, and they just wanted to present that they are still in power, that they're still still in control. Um, while this was all going on, I mean, we were uh, working in um, in in Yemen uh, along with a number of other international organizations, and our. And, and Mercy Corps' initial uh, program basically focused around uh, youth and conflict mitigation and conflict prevention. And it was really interesting to see that during the course of 2011, how the young people, in, in particularly in the South where we were working, uh, were, were commenting and, and, and the, the ideas and views that were coming out from, from these young, young uh, boys and girls about the changes that are happening in, in, in Sana'a and, and beyond were, were, were very interesting. Comments like, you know, where they, they, they had everything planned right down to the T. I mean, they, they said, okay, we want to first get rid of him. Then we want to see what the next step is. I mean, they, they had, ev they, they were just, it was, it, was, it was all, you know, in many ways spontaneous and yet they still had all the same, um, they were all seemed to be singing from the same hymn sheet because the hymn sheet was basically saying, get rid of Ahmed Abdullah Saleh. Um, and uh, then, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, sorry. I mean, well, they also want to get rid of Ahmed, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge getting rid of the son at the moment. 
But that was that was what was so unique about it that even with a limited communication, limited uh, uh, you know social uh, networks and NGOs and civil society, the this this spontaneous grassroots movement and these these long marches and peaceful marches were, were, were quite amazing from, from, from that perspective. But as this was all going on, um, evidence started to surface more and more that Yemen is also in the grip, grip of a significant humanitarian crisis. And, um, you know, of course, there was, there was always, um, you know, Yemen was always in the news with the uh, movement of refugees from and, and, and people from migrants from the Horn of Africa into Yemen and then onwards. And but, you know, Yemen was always and continues to be a transit country. I mean, uh, like many other transit countries around the world, I mean, people come in and land on the shores of Yemen but over 50% of them don't actually physically stay in Yemen. They, they move into the Gulf countries for, for jobs and employment opportunities, and from there they try to move into Turkey and then onwards into, into Europe. But nevertheless, there was a, a significant influx of predominantly Somalis uh, fleeing the Horn of Africa, fleeing Somalia both because of the war as well as the famine that was there, uh, in addition to that, you had Ethiopians, Eritreans, Djibouti, you know, so that was always in the news. Uh, you had the fighting going on in the north, in Sada, between the Houthis, which is a, a Shia a faction against the, the government and then against the, the, the Salafis. Um, so you had displacements from there. So this was always in the news. What what wasn't in the news was basically the 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 nutritional crisis that now has uh, uh, surfaced and has, has, has shown its, its, its very ugly and dangerous head, where according to uh, conservative figures, I mean, over 10 million Yemenis uh, are hungry. Uh, 5 million are hungry uh, uh, seasonally, but 5 million Yemenis are hungry throughout the year. And 30% of those are actually children. So we have close to a million children under the age of five in Yemen which, who are hungry and go to bed hungry every night, even right now. This is out of a population of 24 uh, million people. So uh, we're talking about about 40% of the population is, um, is in, in, a, in a dire humanitarian crisis. And the numbers, unfortunately, are increasing. As more and more assessments and more and more areas become accessible, uh, more and more teams are going in and, and, and conducting these assessments, we are seeing these numbers starting to increase. So, but, so with, with, the, with the political crisis going on, in, as well as this humanitarian crisis and, of course, the economic meltdown that, that Yemen was facing, we were, we were situated in a perfect storm that, that, was, that was hitting the country and, is, and has plagued the country. And the, the crisis has basically metastasized throughout the whole, uh, the whole country itself, in effect, affecting both rural and urban, urban communities. However, there are two clear points that I'd like to make right from the onset. First of all, the humanitarian crisis is not a result of the political crisis. It was already there. The political crisis only well, played a catalyst to basically make, expand it and, and, and uh, exasperate the, the, the humanitarian crisis. So those pundits that say now with the political solution in, in place, so the humanitarian solution is also in place, I'm afraid, are, are not entirely correct. Secondly, the humanitarian crisis as it is right now is not a food crisis. It is a malnutrition and nutrition crisis. There is food in the country. There is lots of food in the country. Um, uh, true, you know, 90% of the food is imported. Uh, in the 70s and, and early 80s, Yemen was a net exporter of food and fed the Arabian Peninsula. Now it is a net importer of food. Uh, there are other stories why that has happened, and we, we can talk about that if you like. 
But there is food in the market, uh, both staples as well as, you know, some deluxe foods, you know, like uh, uh, Jim John West tuna is, is also there. But there, there, is, there is potatoes, onions, garlic, tomatoes, rice, wheat. But it's just people can't afford it. It has become very, very expensive. Uh, food prices have increased anywhere between 26 to 38 percent over the last 14 to 16 months, and they're still going up. Fuel prices, both kerosene, coal, as well as compressed national, uh, uh, natural gas, have also gone up. Price of water has also gone up. So combined with all that, it's resulted in this nutritional crisis that parents and individuals cannot, sim they simply cannot afford to purchase the food. The, the indigenous coping mechanisms that existed were be because of the, uh, some Islamic tradition and culture of, of helping your neighbor and helping the poor through zakat and other mechanisms have also crumpled because due to the economic meltdown, people have lost jobs, people have lost their assets, people have sold their assets. So in a village, if you had three people who were uh, dependent on the rest of the village, now those three people have become 30 people because the, 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 the safety net has started to, to crumble because uh, now uh, that person, who, the person who was able to give a bowl of rice to, to, his, to his neighbor is unable to give that bowl of rice because he himself is struggling. So that bowl of rice has now become a quarter of a bowl. So that has resulted in the breakdown of the indigenous coping mechanisms. And that is both in the rural and the urban areas, but predominantly more in the urban areas because they were dependent on imp, uh, support from the rural areas. And because of the crisis in the urban centers when war was, uh, was being waged, farmers couldn't come into the urban centers to sell their produce. So their produce was, was sitting, sitting back in, in their villages and rotting away uh, since they did not have, you know, there was no cottage industry to try and, you know, do some pickling of, 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 of their produce or, or, or drying of their produce. So that also resulted in, in, in uh, rural communities starting to feel the, uh, uh, the, the punch. Water and access to good quality water has always been a, an issue in, in Yemen, as, as many of you obviously know that that Sana'a will become probably the first capital city in the world to run out of water. And it's not happening in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in 50 years' time. It's happening very, very soon. 2017 to 2025 are the predicted dates for this, uh, this crisis to, to, to happen. So generally, access to water has been and continues to be a challenge. And, and, all, and, and as you know here that if you even if you have nutritional food available if your quality of water is poor and the, the quality of water that you're cooking the food in is poor then the impact of that will be negligible on the health of, of uh, uh, the children and the family so that has resulted in in, 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 a, in a significant humanitarian crisis and, um, you know, the U.S. government and other governments are, have been comparing the crisis in the, the nutritional crisis and, and food, uh, food insecurity crisis in Yemen to the Horn of Africa and to the Sahel. Um, fine, the numbers in the Horn of Africa and Sahel are much higher, but the percentage is much greater in, um, in Yemen. The other point is that I that I make to to my to my colleagues in, uh, in in the U.S. government and the British government is that the Sahel is is three or four countries put together, and the Horn of Africa is two or three countries put together. Yemen is just on its own, and and the crisis is therefore more more concentrated. The if if you can see a silver lining, I mean the only silver lining that that is coming out of this is that the mortality figures of children under five is still very low in Yemen. Um, there is a lot of discussion and, and, and debate going on uh, around why that is the case. I mean, is it because the Yemenis over, over a very long period of time have developed a lot of resistance and resilience towards, uh, towards you know, 
little <coughs> amount of food and are able to live on a, a, a very limited diet. Um, however, there, there, there are a number of, uh, of, of interesting um, uh, ideas and, uh, th that are being tabled and, and, and being researched. Yes, you know, the Yemenis do have a very peculiar diet as far as I'm concerned, and, and, and many are concerned. I mean, they have a great, you know, aversion towards leafy vegetables. I mean, they, they, they consume meat, they love to consume meat, and by God, it's great. But, I mean, leafy vegetables, carrots, vegetables, and in general, are just not consumed. I mean, the only vegetable that is openly consumed is potato. But any other vegetables that are, uh, which are available in the market, which have strong nutritional value and, and mineral values and vitamins, are, are not consumed. Uh, beans are 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 consumed a lot, but that's the, and, and that's another source source of protein. But but pulses are to a to a lesser extent. So a very strange diet also is resulting in this, um, um, you know, high high uh, numbers of, of uh, anemia, as well as these um, children having uh, vitamin deficiencies and, and mineral deficiencies. But in, in addition to, to, to all that, because of, of the, uh, the, the, the fact that people haven't been able to uh, systematically address this issue over a long period of time, and, and things have just been let let go, and there hasn't been a, a concerted effort to respond to this issue when it was starting off, has resulted in, in now this this becoming a very large crisis. And it it's the you know when the when there were small holes in the dike, we weren't paying much attention, and now when there's a gaping hole in the dike and and, and water is rushing through, we are now realizing as the international community that something needs to be done fast, something needs to be done urgent. The fact that the children's mortality is, is, is very low is, is helpful, but the problem is that Yemen has the highest or the second highest rate of stunting in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in children under five. Afghanistan, unfortunately, is the only other country which has a higher rate. And the problem with stunting, as, 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 as you would know, it's it's also it's very hidden. Even even mothers would not be able to detect if their child uh, is, is stunted, and stunting is also irreversible. Once it reaches a particular age, I mean, I, I believe it's it's about thirty six months, then the intellectual uh, uh, stunting will be set, and no matter how good quality water, food you then provide the child, the child will be able to continue to live, but will have permanently uh, uh, will be permanently damaged as far as uh, his or her intellectual and physical growth is concerned so if things aren't done now at a monumental scale uh, we will be seeing in, in 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 five to ten years time a million a million and a half two million children in Yemen who will be permanently stunted and uh, in, in, in my in my humble opinion, you can't really build a nation when you have a, a significant population that is unable to to operate and live a normal and healthy life. I'll stop here for for a moment. I know I haven't introduced Mercy Corps, Ruth, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I work for Mercy Corps, by the way, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we have an office here in Boston, not very far away from here. Um, and I've been, I'm the country director there. I've been in Yemen for the last um, uh, nine months, eight months. And um, I've been involved in, in humanitarian uh, work for, for a fairly long uh, time, particularly dealing with complex emergencies. So um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, questions? Can you give us uh, an appraisal of the uh, movement of Al Qaeda in the Arab? Yemen. Okay, um, <laughs> they're there. I mean, there's 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 no uh, there's no ifs ands and buts about it, and and they are present. But the question is that I mean, why 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 present in Yemen? What what is it that attracts them to come to Yemen? 
it is all these elements that when, when you have young people unemployed and disgruntled and unable to make ends meet, and they have exactly the same, you know, uh, you know, dreams and wishes as anybody else, that they want to live a happy and peaceful life, they want a job, they want a family, they want to have kids. But when that is not available to them, obviously desperate times means desperate actions. And, and, and uh, organizations, groups like, like AQAP, like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and many other radical groups will take advantage and then unfortunately hire such young people you know, for $100 a day and ask them to, uh, to fight, fight for a cause. Um, having having uh, met a couple of these young, young lads, uh, they don't have any strong Islamic conviction, but it's the fact is it's a job. I mean, that's the only job available. They've left $80 with their mum so that she could buy groceries and, and, and feed the rest of the family, and then the $20 they, they use <coughs> for uh, their, uh, their, their allowance. So it, it is there. It is a menace. Um, obviously, you know, it's, uh, it, it's causing a lot of concern for, for, for normal Yemenis, for ordinary Yemenis themselves. 99% of the Yemenis do not like them, do not support them. But, um, you know, the, the reality is that there are so many other factors that result in, in, uh, in, in the situation that attracts such radical groups. It is paramount that those issues are addressed first and foremost in order to quickly uh, eradicate radical groups like AQAP permanently from, from, uh, from Yemen and other parts. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. I'm from Syria, but I grew up in Yemen in the 70s. And some of these issues still hit my back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in your reaction to the following concerns. Number one, why is it the rich Gulf countries in the region did not recognize that it's in their national interest that this country uh, get a get better situation and mm-hmm. eventually it will harm them? Number two, why is it all these development organizations, including the World Bank and others, keep meeting and having conferences, <coughs> but yet, despite all the efforts, we don't see results on the ground? Until last uh, summer, I used to work for the Islamic Development Bank, and we financed six higher education projects in Yemen in the last 10 years, while the unemployment rate is over 43%. I don't know what we were doing there. So the, the issue, why? Isn't we, we as collectively as a development organization we were ineffective and we were tackled. And last thing, uh, the cut thing. Do you think there is any change in the cut problem after this Arab <coughs> Spring? Cut is a uh, a plant oh, right, right. that uh, they, they they chew and it, it they say it gives you a high. You have to chew quite a bit of it to get that, but I wouldn't know. Um, good questions, really good questions. And um, there, there is a, a, a cynical response to that when, and when they say that, you know, because you, you, you read a lot of documentation and they say, you know, Yemen is a failing state. And, and that's one of the reasons why international attention hasn't been that great, because it's failing. If it had failed, there would be a great, great degree of attention. And that's what the Gulf countries have been doing. They've just been preventing it from going right over the cliff. And when they see it about to reach there, you know, you see these long convoys of resources being driven in from the north, from Saudi Arabia, into into Yemen to just give that little bit of injection. But but to be honest, I mean, you know, Yemen has. Um, I mean, I. I really don't think that it is in the interest of, it might be in the interest of the Gulf governments to see a stable and prosperous Yemen. But they are individuals within those countries. Some of them are actually richer and more powerful than the country itself, who really don't want to see a prosperous and stable Yemen. They have vested interests particularly in the sale of arms. Um, for example, the, the, the governor of Sada, the largest arms dealer in the country. Why would he want peace 
You know, it, 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 it's a livelihood and business issue for him. There are other elements also within the Gulf countries that are, are associated with radical groups. They are supporting the Salafis. They, they are supporting other groups within, uh, within Yemen which are preventing Yemen's development. They were supporting uh, the former regime in, in, in fighting the Houthis. And Iran was supporting the Houthis, so Yemen was being used as a proxy ground mm -hmm. for Iran and Saudi uh, uh, issues. So, so, so Yemen has has been constantly getting a raw deal, not only from from uh, from its neighboring countries, but also within. I'm fascinated to see in Yemen the the number of spoilers that exist there, that the, own, the Yemenis themselves who are benefiting and profiteering from this complete chaos and, and mayhem. Those, uh, I mean, the, the, the famous uh, port deal that uh, was, was developed between, uh, Aden, uh, between Yemen and, and Dubai ports, which basically resulted in Aden becoming a ghost town because now Dubai gets the port and, and uh, the ships and Hodeida gets, uh, gets the deal. And, and Aden, you know, got a complete raw deal. This was done by the government of Yemen, and and and, and without any sort of uh, discussion or consultation with the people of Aden, with the people of the south, that I mean, you know, because th they they've completely lost lost their business. I mean, Aden in the 1800s was the third busiest port in the world after New York and Rotterdam, and now it's it's you, you can hardly see a tugboat there. So it, it, is, it is an extremely complicated uh, situation in, in, in Yemen. Uh, like other countries, like Afghanistan, like uh, Somalia, the neighboring countries have vested interests in, in Yemen. And some of those vested interests are in the development of the country. Some of them are keeping it in this situation because even those countries are, to be honest, quite concerned that if they have a stable, prosperous, democratic Yemen at the base of the Arabian Peninsula, their, their, their own positions could be uh, under threat. Because, as you know, I mean, democracy in the GCC countries is, uh, is not a very favorable word, let's put it that way. So, so it, 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 is, it is really interesting to see how that, how that is playing out. And, and it is quite, quite surprising that, yes, with the GCC uh, agreement, you know, it continues to manifest itself. The Houthis were not considered into the GCC agreement. The youth were not taken into account in the GCC agreement. And the Hiraqis, the southern movement, was not taken into consideration when the, GC, when the agreement was, was put together and penned and signed. So, so already, this so-called transition government or this, this peaceful transition from, from one president to, uh, to another has already, you know, from before, it, before the, the, the starter pistol has been fired, you've already alienated three very large groups who were, were not happy in the first place and the, it's just further exasperated their own disappointment and their own suspicion of the interest and, and, and motivations and intentions of the Gulf countries. And with Qatar, yeah, it's a bugger. Uh, no change after this? Nothing, nothing. I mean, I, I had the privilege of sitting with the um, agricultural minister uh, a couple of months ago who openly admits that he does not chew Qatar. And he says, you know, I mean, it, it, he can't do anything about it. I mean, until there is a political change and a, 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 a policy change in, in, uh, in the country, I mean, cut. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Yemen became a net importer of food because, uh, you know, 70, 75 percent of the arable land is now dedicated to growing cut. Ninety percent of surface irrigation <coughs> goes for watering cut. It's 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 ridiculous. I mean, and the it, the the intensity uh, of of use is increasing. So you have uh, pesticides, fertilizer being used. To, to, to grow this uh, crop, resulting in, in people getting you know, more gum disease, more throat cancer, more tooth decay. It's, 
it's ridiculous and it tastes awful. Your uh, suggestion that uh, the supporters of Al Qaeda would be perhaps somewhat better educated, younger men, but in fact, the major sources of instability are in El Jaw, in the Northeast, in the South, Southeast. Those are the same areas, especially in the Northeast, that the Southeast have been giving direct aid to those villages, to the tribal leaders mm -hmm. for decades. And uh, under uh, the uh, former president, they were giving aid directly to other uh, tribes, tribes. Uh, yeah. villages. So, uh, and in fact today, USAID's program focuses on say five or seven of those unsable areas and uh, the special operations in the U.S. military have their own independent rural development programs. They do. Where they're trying to deal with uh, religious leaders. And uh, uh, I guess from what you said at the beginning, you're working on uh, some of the conflict adjudication. I think the NDI, the National Democratic Institute, had a project like that in the past, let's mm -hmm. say. And, uh, is it really window dressing? Is it, is, is it, are, are we as a nation, the American government, do we have a strategy that's addressing the needs of Yemen over the next five or ten years? Are we just doing band-aids? That's a good question you should ask at the Hill and, 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 and see, see what, what the response is. But, but in all fairness, it's not just the U.S. government. It's 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 a concerted effort. I mean, um, well, the Brits are bigger yeah, donor than we are. Exactly. I mean, the Europeans have always been interested in, in Yemen historically, and and, and and the British in particular. Um, it's the 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 the, the one, 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 one ambassador once once told me that the interesting thing is that. Ali Abdullah Saleh has been consistent supporter of the West. It's the West that hasn't been a consistent supporter of, of <coughs> Ali Abdullah Saleh. I mean, if assistance had been provided to Yemen, you know, along the lines that you were mentioning, you know, uh, uh, introducing, you know, concepts of rule of law, supporting rural communities, supporting, you know, uh, uh, local governance, bringing in uh, uh, education schemes, but on a consistent basis and 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 throughout the, the the years, yes, you would see a different Yemen. But they you know there were peaks and troughs. I mean, at when when there was an interest, there was there was a lot of in, uh, investment going into the country. When that interest uh, died away, that investment died away. After after the incident of coal, the, uh, the U.S.'s coal incident in in, in Aden. You know, obviously, uh, aid, aid dropped, or different mode of aid came into the country. So it's, it, it is, it, it. You I mean your question addresses the broader uh, uh, question of of how humanitarian and development assistance is uh, being channeled to two countries like Yemen, two countries like I mean, there, there are many countries like Yemen. I mean, the same example can be given for Somalia. That I mean. If, if aid was, was channeled on a consistent basis for a long period of time, both technical assistance as well as financial assistance, we wouldn't be in this situation. But, uh, but as a result, it has fluctuated. Other countries have got their own interests. You are absolutely right. The Saudis were, were at one hand, supporting uh, the president. We're also supporting the people opposing the president. You know, it, it, it was... It's, because it was in their vested interest to keep um, things uh, a wee bit unstable in Yemen, but not too crazy that would affect them, but difficult enough to, for them to continue living a very peaceful life in, in Riyadh and, and, and beyond. Would you want to comment on the drone program? Do I want to comment on the drone program? I mean, I think it fits in It does fit. In this <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I mean... That's that's an approach. I mean, being used by uh, by not only the U.S. government but but others. I mean, for for uh, on on their counterterrorism uh, uh, activities. I mean, Yemen has now recently been um, 
uh, evidence has been indicated is a country that's that's more uh, there's more drone attacks in Yemen than there are, for example, in Pakistan. But uh, it it is w one really needs to see and do an assessment that you know how effective is it? Is it is it really getting the the miscreants or wh whatever you want to label them or call them or are you just causing more people to be uh, disgruntled and uh, creating more miscreants than, than actually getting rid of them? I mean, it is, it is a concern for, for uh, particularly for humanitarian organizations that the, the investment being put in for drone attacks, if that kind of investment is d redirected towards helping and, 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 and educating and employing young people in Yemen, we would see a very different uh, scenario than we, we're, we're seeing today. You want to come in? So I have a question. I, I don't really understand why the prices of food are going up. Is it just a cat issue? Why the price of food has gone up? Yeah. Well, I mean, the food is, is, is basically 90% of it is imported. So global food prices play a, a huge role in, um, in, 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 the, in the price of food that you, you buy off the shelves in, 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 in Yemen. In addition to that, the government was subsidizing uh, s some of the, 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 the costs. But with the uh, uh, political upheaval and the breakdown of, of uh, and, and the loss of, of vast uh, res you know, reserves and the government wasn't able to then further subsidize those uh, those prices, mm -hmm. and therefore you saw an increase in fuel because the pumping stations and the fuel was was not being uh, provided on time. Transportation costs started to increase, as well as delivery costs started to increase. So uh, that all coupled together was resulting in, a, in, in an increase in the uh, in the price of food. Do you know whether there are any political factions or uh, military fa or paramilitary or military fa uh, advocacy groups offering uh, alternative, uh, offering themselves as alternative to Al Qaeda? As I say, one of Al Qaeda's objectives is to uh, uh, is redistributionist. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's uh, one of their objectives is, uh, uh, you know, uh, helping the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the means that they use are, I would assume for most people in this room, very objectionable. Mm -hmm. But that particular objective, you know, I mean, this is Frank, this is, this is, <laughs> this is Christianity, this is, this is Judaism. This is it's all of the major religions. So uh, uh, the question is, you know, the the Saudis in particular would would be might might tend to be uh, opposing such you know liberal quasi socialist political goals because the Saudis are, are you know they want to hold on to you know, they they're, they're tend, they I mean they they're, they're very personal in, in sharing their wealth. But they don't, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's like symbolic more than, anyway, and they aren't so much concerned with other countries than their own. Than their own. Uh, but, I, but the question basically is, are, are there, you know, alternatives, you know, liberal as opposed to terrorist alternatives offering left-wing uh, redistribution solutions as, as, as political goals, as rallying points you know, that would take it would, it would be the enemies of Al Qaeda, just like the li the liberals used to be the enemies. Uh, you still are uh, to, uh, the enemies of the communists, despite what Rush Limbaugh has to say. You know, I mean, uh, but uh, good question. I mean, uh, is there a vision uh, or, or or some champions? Are, are you talking about indigenous change? Yemeni groups or, or uh, external pe uh, pe individuals? You know, uh, groups, groups. In, in Yemen. Uh, whether they're indigenous Yemenis or, you know, uh, hybrid indigenous and uh, external people, uh, or whether or is Al Qaeda getting all of those people, all of that, all those people who, who I mean, is, is anybody attracting people who want 
you know, left-wing goals mm -hmm. uh, away from Al Qaeda, or is yeah. Al Qaeda getting all of them? You know. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean uh, Al Qaeda's role. I mean, we, we also have to be very careful here. I mean, it's it's it's, it's very very limited. I mean, you know, it's, it's very small, but it just it just make a big firecracker. And it, 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 there are of course groups, local indigenous Yemeni groups. I mean, um, you know, uh, street communities, uh, urban as well as rural uh, groups, that are there, and have that philanthropic and and charity giving uh, uh, approach. Uh, that that does exist both in in, in 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 the urban centers as well as in the rural centers. Is that uh, really talking about philanthropic? I'm talking about you know, taxes and progressive taxes. Okay, so I'm not talking about you know uh, uh, Catholic charities or you know Islamic charities. I'm talking about groups that that, that want to tax the rich. Mm -hmm. So so that take the Islah Party for example. Do you see uh, potentially? Uh, a leading role for change and reform in, in that party. That's the equivalent of the Muslim Brotherhood. Absolutely, Egypt. yeah. I mean, they, they it, at, at the moment, I, I would, uh, I mean, if, if, if you say today, I, I would be very comfortable in saying no. Uh, no, you would. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, what happens tomorrow? How these, you know, this, this, this whole national dialogue and this political transition takes place? Of course, it's also seen that Islah will probably, you know, if, if there is elections or when there is elections, Islah will probably win the election. Um, do they have a, a, a charitable uh, an, uh, wing? Do they have a, uh, a, 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 I mean, they have an NGO called CSSW, which, uh, which does exactly what, what you're saying, you know, and does, uh, you know, it, it's, it's their uh, social development arm of it. What, whether they will tax the rich? A lot of the rich people are members of Islah, and uh, Islah has a very particular and, and interesting agenda of, of its own. But only time will tell whether they'll be able... I mean, what, what you are uh, proposing or envisioning is... Um, it, it's, it's not happening at the moment, but I'm, I'm, I would be very surprised to see it happen even in the short term, because Yemen is going through such a a a, a, a transition, uh, and they it, it itself doesn't know where it's going to eventually stabilize and settle down, and then be able to rebuild uh, itself, and how it's going to be rebuilt. I mean, so it it it, it is a long way to go, uh, for sure. Right. You want to advertise this conference? Uh, yes. Maybe it's focusing on development. Prospects for Yemen, is it? It's, it's looking at well. There is there's a conference. A worldwide conference being planned for October um, 18th through the 20th, uh, focusing on Yemen, the future of Yemen, and uh, addressing a lot of these issues, addressing um, uh, issues of water development, as well as political uh, uh, prospects for the future of uh, Yemen, uh, and uh, women and youth. So we are hoping to have speakers from Yemen as well as Yemeni experts in the U.S. Uh, to address this conference. If you're already on our email list or if you signed our uh, sign-up sheet, you will get an announcement of it. Uh, and we hope that you will join us for that conversation in October. Great. Maybe I should close it. Uh, sure, I mean, 5:30, unless somebody's uh, dying to ask the last oh, question. No, 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 You're not, not dying. No. Not, not dying, but <laughs> eager. Let's say. Just real quick, but are there areas in parts of Yemen have a reputation of being kind of xenophobic, you know, uh, fearful of foreigners? Um, is it safe for NGOs to operate throughout the country? Not throughout the country. There are still pockets within the country that are um, unsafe or for certain organizations. I mean, uh, national organizations have greater access and are able to, to operate in those areas. International organizations are not. Um, but uh, but, those, but they, they keep fluctuating. And it's, it's not so much more around xenophobia or anything like that. It's also uh, criminality, unfortunately, has, has started to gather a, uh, and, and establish a very strong uh, foothold in the country. And that's, of course, linked directly to the economic, uh, uh, you know, problems in the country. 
the question about uh, taxing. Yemen doesn't have an infrastructure for taxes. No. There isn't a cadastral survey. So there's no basis for local taxes. And the national taxes, there's minimal, if any, taxes. It's import export mm -hmm. uh, taxes. So the, the country is really at a very low level of institutional development. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So uh, thank you to the Middle East Institute for organizing this. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and most, mostly thank you, Muhammad, for coming to share with us all, all your knowledge. I'm sure many people want to connect with you and exchange cards now. Perfect. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you.